We're reading through the Bible in one year, October 30th, 2 Kings 15, Ephesians 4, Ezekiel 46, and Luke 5, 1 through 26. In the 27th year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, Azariah, the son of Amaziah, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 16 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 52 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jechaliah of Jerusalem, and he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah had done. Nevertheless, the high places were not taken away, and the people still sacrificed and made offerings on the high places. And the Lord touched the king so that he was a leper to the day of his death. And he lived in a separate house. And Jotham, the king's son, was over the household, governing the people of the land. Now the rest of the acts of Azariah and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? And Azariah slept with his fathers, and they buried him with his fathers in the city of David. And Jotham, his son, reigned in his place. In the thirty-eighth year of Azariah, king of Judah, Zechariah, the son of Jeroboam, reigned over Israel and Samaria six months, and he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, as his fathers had done. He did not depart from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin. Shalom, the son of Jabesh, conspired against him and struck him down at Ibleam and put him to death and reigned in his place. Now the rest of the deeds of Zechariah, behold, they are written in the, books of the, in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel. This was the promise of the Lord that he gave to Jehu. Your sons shall sit on your throne, sit on the throne of Israel to the fourth generation. And so it came to pass. Shalom, the son of Jabesh, began to reign in the 39th year of Uzziah, king of Judah. And he uh, he reigned one month in Samaria. Then Menahem, the 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 son of Gadi, came up from Terzah and came to Samaria. And he struck down Shalom, the son of Jabesh, in Samaria, and put, to, put him to death and reign in his place. Now the deeds, the rest of the deeds of Shalom, and the conspiracy that he made, behold, they are written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel. At that time, Menahem uh, sacked Tifsa and all who were in it, and its territory from Terza on, because they did not open it to him. Therefore he sacked it, and he ripped open all the women in it who were pregnant. In the thirty-ninth year of Azariah, or Azariah, king of Judah, Menahem, the son of Gadi, began to reign over Israel. And he reigned ten years in Samaria, and he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart all his days from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin. Pul, the king of Assyria, came against the land, and Menahem gave Pul a thousand talents of silver, that he might help him to confirm his hold on the royal power. Menahem exacted the money from Israel, that is, from all the wealthy men, fifty shekels of silver from every man, uh, to give to the king of Syria. So the king of Assyria turned back and did not stay there in the land. Now the rest of the deeds of Menahem, and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel? And Menahem slept with his fathers. And Pekahiah, 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 his son, reigned in his place. In the fifteenth year, Sorry, 50th year of Azariah, king of Judah, Pekahiah, the son of Menahem, began to reign over Israel and Samaria. And he reigned two years, and he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin. And Pekah, the son of Remaliah, his captain, conspired against him with 50 men of the house, sorry, of the people of Gilead, and struck him down in Samaria in the citadel of the king's house, with, with Argob and Areah, and he put him to death and reigned in his place. Now the rest of the deeds of Pekiah and all that he did, behold, they are written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel. In the fifty-second year of Azariah the king of Judah, Pekah the son of Remaliah began to reign over Israel and Samaria, and he reigned twenty-two years, and he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin. In the days of Pekah, king of Israel, Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria, came and captured Ejon, Abel-Bath-Mecha, Genoa, Kadesh, 
Hazor, Gilead, Galilee, and all the land of Naphtali. And he carried the people captive to Assyria. Then Hoshea, the son of Elah, made a conspiracy against Pekah, the son of Remaliah, and struck him down and put him to death and reigned in his place. In the twentieth year of Jotham, the son of Uzziah. Now the rest of the acts of Pekah and all that he did, behold, they are written in the chronicles of the kings of Israel. In the second year of Pekah, the son of Remaliah, the king of Israel, Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jerusha, the son of, sorry, the daughter of Zadok. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, according to all that his father Uzziah had done. Nevertheless, the high places were not removed. The people still sacrificed and made offerings on the high places. And he built the upper gate of the house of the Lord. Now the rest of the acts of Jotham and all that he did, are they not written in the chronicles of the kings of Judah? In those days, the Lord began to send Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, against Judah. Jotham slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David, his father. And Ahaz, his son, reigned in his place. Now Ephesians 4. So Paul continues this letter of unity between the people. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, and eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, and there is one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. And saying, he ascended, well, what does it mean but that he had descended into the lower regions, the earth? Now, there's people who confuse us and say, well, when he did when he went down into the lower regions, he must have gone to hell. And this is where he was in hell and doing all... No, 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 no. The lower regions is the earth. That's why there's a comma here to delineate that. The lower regions, compared to heaven, is the earth. He who descended is also... Sorry, is the one who also ascended far above the heavens, that he might fill all things... And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature, the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with uh, with which it is equipped when when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their minds. This is where he explains what that futility of their minds means. Everywhere you see the red right here, that's what he's doing. All the way through the uh, end of verse 19. So here's their futility of their minds. This is the minds of the Gentiles. Um, basically anybody who's not a Christian. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. Conversely, but that is not the way you learn Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus to put off 
your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin, and do not let the sun go down on your anger, and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Instead, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Now Ezekiel 46. Thus says the Lord God, The gate of the inner court that faces east shall be shut on the six working days, but on the Sabbath day it shall be opened. And on the day of the new moon it shall be opened. The prince shall enter by the vestibule of the gate from the outside and shall take his stand by the post of the gate. The priest shall offer his burnt offering and his peace offering, and he shall worship at the threshold of the gate. Then he shall go out, but the gate shall not be shut uh, until evening. The people of the land shall bow down at the entrance of that gate before the Lord on the Sabbaths and on the new moons. The burnt offerings that the prince offers to the Lord on the Sabbath day shall be six lambs without blemish and a ram without blemish. And the grain offering with uh, with the ram shall be an ephah, and the grain offering with the lamb shall be as much as he is able, together with a hen of oil to each ephah. On the day of the new moon he shall offer a bull of the herd without blemish, and six rams and a lamb, which uh, shall be without blemish. As a grain offering, he shall provide an ephah with the bull, and an ephah with the ram, and with the lambs as much as he is able, together with a hen of oil to each ephah. That when the prince enters, he shall enter by the vestibule of the gate, and he shall go out by the same way. When the people of the land come before the Lord at the appointed feast, he who enters by the north gate to worship shall go out by the south gate. And he who enters by the south gate shall go out by the north gate. No one shall return by the way of the gate by which he entered, but each shall go out straight ahead. When they enter, the prince shall enter with them, and when they go out, he shall go out. At the feast, at the appointed festivals, <clears throat> excuse me, and the grain offering with the young bull shall be an ephah, and with a ram an ephah, with the lambs as much as uh, one is able to give, together with a hint of oil to an ephah. When the prince provides a free will offering, either a burnt offering or a peace offering as a free will offering to the Lord, the gate facing the east shall be opened for him. But he shall offer his burnt offering or his peace offerings, as he does on the Sabbath day. Then he shall go out, and after he has gone out, the gate shall be shut. You shall provide a lamb a year old without blemish for a burnt offering to the Lord daily. Morning by morning you shall provide it, and you shall provide a grain offering uh, with it morning by morning, one-sixth of an ephah, and a third of a hint of oil to moisten the flour as a grain offering to the Lord. This is a perpetual statute. Thus the lamb and the, uh, and the meal offering and the oil shall be provided morning by morning um, for a regular burnt offering. Thus says the Lord God, if the priest, rather, if the prince makes a gift to any of his sons as his, as his inheritance, it shall belong to his sons. It is their property by inheritance. But if he makes a gift out of his inheritance to one of his servants, it shall be his to the year of liberty. Then it shall revert to the prince. Surely it is his inheritance. It shall belong to his sons. The prince shall not take away, uh, shall not take any of the inheritance of the people, thrusting them out in, of their poverty, sorry, out of their property. He shall give to his sons their inheritance out of his own property, 
so that none of my people shall be scattered from his property. Then he brought me through the entrance, which was at the side of the gate, to the north row of the holy chambers for the priests. And behold, a place was there at the extreme western end of them. And he said to me, This is the place where the priests shall boil the guilt offering and the sin offering, where they shall bake the grain offering, in order not to bring them into the outer court and so transmit holiness to the people. Then he brought me out to the outer court, And led me around to the four corners of the court. And behold, in each corner of the court, there was another court. And in the four corners of the court were small courts, 40 cubits long and 30 broad. The four were of the same size. The area we're looking at here is these little areas right there. Say H in them. On the inside, around um, each of the four courts was a row of masonry with hearths made at the bottom of the rows all around. Then he said to me, These are the kitchens where those who minister at the temple shall boil the sacrifices of the people. Now Luke 5, 1 through 26. <clears throat> on one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of, the, uh, to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of the Gennesaret, And he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out to the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I'll let down the nets. And when he had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. And they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats, so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were uh, partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. While he was in one of the cities, there came a man full of leprosy. The, the, the term full of leprosy means that it covered his entire body. There was nothing on him that looked even the slightest bit uh, non-leprous. He didn't have any clean skin on him anywhere. And when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and begged him, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him in a way that no one would touch him. This guy probably hadn't been touched in years Yet Jesus had that kindness for him that he touched him. He didn't worry about him or his sickness. Saying, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. And he charged him to tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing, as Moses commanded, for a proof to them. But now, even more, the report about him went abroad, and great crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities but he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. On one of those days, as he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were standing there, or were sitting there, who had come from uh, every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was with him to heal. And behold, some men were bringing on a bed a man who was paralyzed, and they were seeking to bring him in and lay him before Jesus, but finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, They went up on the roof and let down um, his bed through the tiles into the midst before Jesus. When he saw their faith, he said, Man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and Pharisees began to question, saying, "Who, who, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? When Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered them, Why do you question in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, rise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, 
pick up your bed and go home. And immediately he rose up before them and picked up what he had been lying on and went home, glorifying God. An amazing, sorry, an amazement seized them all. And they glorified God and were filled with awe, saying, We have seen extraordinary things today. Behold, the word of the Lord. 